My name is Gabby Salzberger, and I have the pleasure of moderating what I know is going to be a terrific conversation. Our panel is on transforming business towards more inclusive growth, and I have two incredible panelists. Uh, the first is Latha Reddy, who's a Senior Vice President of Inclusive Solutions at Prudential Financial and is Chair of the Prudential Foundation. In her roles, Latha harnesses the power of capital markets to drive financial and social mobility. Our other panelist is Jean Case, who is chair of the National Geographic Society and CEO of Case Impact Network, which she founded in 2020 to expand efforts to drive inclusive capitalism. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for both of you um, that hopefully kind of sets the stage for this conversation. Though inclusive growth has long been a stated goal of government and institutions, there were doubts that it could be achieved within our current systems. Then COVID-19 exposed an economic reality that was leaving too many behind and putting our planet at risk in the process. Coming out of COVID-19, knock on wood, and given where we are at the moment economically, what is the role that you each see in moving us towards inclusive growth? And maybe I'll start with Jean. Sure. Well, thanks, Gabriel. It's a real pleasure to be here with both you and Latha. Um, so, you know, I think it's a time of opportunity and challenge. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we think about when we think about inclusive growth is really the movement that it's gone through, where not only is it good business, but it's good for business today. And the overwhelming data that's emerging that shows that diverse teams outperform, right? They outperform not only financially, but even in terms of being innovative. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned, particularly as we learn some of the data around women. You know, it's been reported lately that as many as 3.5 million have left the workforce during COVID. And we know that women overall, working women, contribute about $8 trillion to our GDP. So McKinsey called it uh, an emergency for corporate America. So I think there's just lots to unpack here. I look forward to, to doing that with you uh, through this conversation. Um, Latha, your thoughts? Sure. So I will just add, it's also great to be here with both of you to have this really important conversation as I think about the role of business and certainly companies like Prudentials in driving inclusive growth, I think it's about every decision we make every day. And that is both the simplicity and the complexity of what we're talking about. And, you know, I think about it in probably three major areas. So it's first of all, for us as employers and making sure that we are behaving as high road employers and taking care of our employees and making sure they're offering quality jobs with robust benefits and we have policies and practices to support that. It's also about how we go to market and making sure that we're going to market inclusively. And, you know, the first part of what I described, making sure that we're taking care of our employees, right, is a huge dependency in terms of how we show up in the market uh, and having the competencies and the diversity of thinking uh, to bring to bear on that. And then the last part, I think, is in addition to going to market in a way that addresses societal issues, and we can talk about this, and I think we should, um, The it's really about additional ways to engage in societal issues as well. So philanthropy uh, is an important critical resource, always has been, especially in times of crisis and crises, like what we saw over the last 18 months or so. Um, you know, but also how we engage in public policy and how we use our voice in different ways. And so I think those are all critical dimensions to driving growth, inclusive growth. Well, great, Latha. I'd love to follow up a little bit, uh, you know, on you've outlined these three kind of broad areas in which companies and organizations, you know, can can think about and kind of a framework, really, for thinking about um, inclusive growth. Can you talk a little bit more specifically at Prudential uh, about how you have been embedding uh, in inclusive economic growth, both into the business as well as how you have been engaging leaders within the business to do the work. So we've been uh, at this for a while in a very concerted way. So I'd say over the last six or so years, it's been a bit of a bottoms up approach. And 
working with business leaders, individual leaders across the company who, uh, you know, share this passion for engaging in societal issues through our business and bringing all of our resources to bear. So it's everything from our philanthropy or impact investing to our core business capabilities, such as manufacturing products. And the way that can manifest or has manifested is, uh, I'll just give a few examples. You know, one is around creating new distribution capabilities for the company in a way that addresses the needs of communities that have been underserved. So we partnered with the nonprofit to uh, provide financial education and awareness to uh, members of black churches. And so this entity that we partnered with D3 is partnering with these very trusted, right, incredible sources of information in the black community. And so it's an opportunity to create um pathways for financial education and also pathways for people to access uh, financial professionals if they uh, choose to. So that's one example. I think, you know, another around product development. So we all know the statistics around uh, Americans and the lack of savings for financial emergencies, right? Almost 60% of Americans do not have $400 in cash. And so we've created an emergency savings feature in addition to our 401 uh, in-plan offering for our employer clients. And so uh, long story short, it's a way for employees of these clients to save alongside uh, their retirement plans, but in a way that enables them to take out the cash without taking it out from their 401k, which we know has negative compounding impacts for people. So it's been things like that that we've been engaged in. But what we're doing now is stepping back and trying to take a more of a top-down approach, I would say, which is looking at the really big, significant financial challenges of our time, such as the racial wealth gap, how we can, again, come together across the enterprise to address that challenge, um, but in a way that's more holistic and really marshals all our credentials expertise. Yeah, Gabriel, I would just pick up on that and say, so I think we're seeing progress in corporate America. We're not there by any stretch of the imagination, but some of the things Latha just talked about, you know, companies really are thinking about. But we also have what I call a little bit of a pipeline issue because every big company today started as a startup. And so I think it's really important to look across, you know, the startup ecosystem and at entrepreneurs and ask where's that capital going? How are they being supported? And I have to tell you, the data there is a little bit dire, even though I believe there's lots of sort of uh, reasons for hope today, let's call it. So, you know, last year in venture capital, only 2.2% of venture capital went to women-led only firms. I mean, come on. It's like, you know, the new millennium and we're talking about 98 percent of the capital still going to men. The combination of black and Latinx founders only received 2.4 percent. Um, so, you know, we really have a lot of work to do there. But the encouraging thing to me is that I am seeing, uh, you know, new capital flowing that way. Lots of new activities. There were 275 new venture capital funds started by women. Um, we have a number of different accelerators and incubators that are focused on both black, or rather all three, black, Latinx, and women in terms of entrepreneurs. Uh, things like Hello Alice, which has a couple hundred thousand entrepreneurs that are part of their network. Digital Undivided in Atlanta specifically focused on women of color that are entrepreneurs. Um, you know, Goldman Goldman Sachs has their 10 billion and 1 million, 10 billion dollars of investment going to new firms led by black women with the goal of 1 million black women that, that they'll stand behind. And, you know, if you look at what NASDAQ and Goldman have done, they've said, look, we're not going to list a company unless you have a woman on your board. And at one level you go, well, what's one, one woman on the board? But I think there's plenty of data to show us that women and people of color on a board, any form of board diversity, just, you know, we see that then have a viral effect throughout the organization and sometimes even into the supply chain. Let me shift gears a little bit. Um, there's a, a generational shift in the way that um, both investors and consumers, like NextGen, for example, um, they're, they they're think differently about how they do business that's in line with their values. How is that trend impacting the market and the work that you are both doing with regard to inclusive economic growth? 
Sure. Well, you know, we have a newsletter uh, out there called For What It's Worth of WIW, and its specific mission is to really bring confidence and knowledge to next generation investors. And interestingly enough, we found women really drawn to it as well. You know, what we see in next gen investors and with female investors is they have moved from conscious consumers to very conscious investors. And, you know, they're very interested in the topic we're talking about today. They're equally interested in sustainability. But particularly with next gen, Gabriel, you know, what we see is a level of activity and investing much younger and at a much higher rate, both Gen Z and millennials, than the generations that came before them. And, you know, that's good news if they get it right. But what we need to be make, sh- make sure we're doing is arming them with how to tell what is greenwashing, how to look for the data in the companies you want to invest in to make sure they really are aligning their values and their investing together and sort of, you know, techniques and tools to help them do just that. So I would pick up on that, Jean, on the um, ensuring that it's not, you know, greenwashing or right that it's what companies are saying they're doing is real and deep and substantive. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do is demonstrate, right, and live those values every day. Because, as you said, investors are asking the question, right, certainly the governance crowd and the index funds and, and folks, you know, folks who are voting their proxies are paying attention to this. And so uh, by necessity, we do, too. And as importantly, if we want to compete for top talent that's coming up right uh, through the workforce now, and we don't lose them to the startups that Gene talked about and the disruptors, right, we know that we need to be authentic about this because you're absolutely right. The uh, you know younger generations are looking for this. They're looking for companies that are doing it through their core business strategy, not as a parallel philanthropic strategy, but that are actually taking these issues head on through right the business that they're in. Latha, could you just spend a minute telling us a little bit more about the Aspen Partnership Renewal? Prudential is uh, really excited and pleased to have renewed our partnership with the Aspen Institute, which is uh, based on over a decade of working together collaboratively to reconnect conversations around work and wealth. And so this uh, extension of our partnership, the renewal, will take this work uh, even further and really focus on equity uh, in all of this. And again, this concept of inclusive growth. So really pleased to uh, continue the partnership. Well, as we think about emerging opportunities, kind of, again, kind of this post-COVID world, um, emerging opportunities for leaders who are looking for opportunities to, to shape the environment and to take meaningful action. You know, as we close, what would you each say to these business le- leaders who are trying to figure this out? Um, what are some of the near-term opportunities um, for these businesses to make real impact? And maybe Latha, this time I'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I think some of the most impactful things are actually within closest reach. So again, as I said, right, it's about beginning from within, within our own four walls and making sure that we're taking care of our own and that um, we are creating cultures and environments that are fully inclusive where people feel safe and feel like they belong. And, you know, so I think it begins with culture and ends with culture too, right? Uh, Because that will eat, as they say, eat your strategy uh, for lunch. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's, you know, then it's about how are you creating those integrated business strategies that are looking at the societal issues that are going to impact your business if you're really in it for the long term. And again, that's applicable whether you're big, small, legacy or startup, um, right, going at it that way. And then it's looking to see if you're really holding yourselves accountable and others, right, uh, accountable in your organization. So that, as Jean said, is not just window dressing, right, and you're really doing this in meaningful ways. And then it's about being transparent. So how are we shining a light on what we're doing, what we're learning? Even if it's not working, let's fail fast and then move on and pivot to something that is working. Yeah, I really, I want to sort of second Latha's important point about Look, every leader is thinking about how they attract and retain best-in-class talent. At the end of the day, I think business is a lot of battle for talent, right? And sometimes I think we can get all caught up in really complicated things 
But I think there are some simple things here, you know, and one is that it starts with intentionality. And while that sounds really simple, I think without the intentionality being really sincere and really playing out from the top down within an organization, that's where we see big change. But I must tell you, in my role as chair at National Geographic, you know, when I took over several years ago, um, I looked at our Explorer class. We bring them to our campus once a year and 80 percent of them were men. And yet it was like, hmm, that doesn't really feel like the world to me. And if we're telling the stories of the world, we have to change that. Similarly, our board wasn't terribly diverse. You fast forward the tape with that intentionality and an organization that really embraced it. You know, today our employee, uh, sorry, our Explorer ranks are 50-50. Technically this year, it's 51% women. And our board, I'll take it against any board out there in terms of its level of diversity. So it's really just, a, in many cases, a, a case of committing yourselves to it with real intentionality and follow through. Right. Well, I agree. Um, so I think we're at the end of our time. I, I really want to thank you both for your um, great insights and observations and also um, as importantly for all the work that you are doing to make a difference in your organizations and and um, and, and, and in making our kind of these more inclusive. So thank you both. Thank you. Great to be with you. <laughs>